Donc, euh, sur le contexte de son, ce congrès, quelques mots, euh, on arrive au moment de la signature de la quatrième période de conventionnement du GIS avec le CNRS et avec euh, la dizaine de partenaires signataires dont euh, quelques-uns nous ont fait euh, le plaisir de venir demain euh, dire un mot euh, au moment du cocktail. Le projet scientifique pour cette nouvelle période, donc 2023-2027, il a été travaillé au sein du conseil scientifique, la direction collégiale, euh, conseil scientifique présidé par Catherine Neveu, donc on espère qu'elle sera prochainement de retour et on sait, on peut vous dire qu'elle continue à œuvrer pour, pour le conseil scientifique, notamment pour l'organisation du prix de thèse de la Commission nationale du débat public. Euh, ce prix de thèse sera décerné lors de nos prochaines journées doctorales et d'ailleurs annonce officielle, ces journées doctorales se tiendront du 22 au 26 mai. 2023 à La Rochelle, et on remercie Alice Mazot et l'Université de La Rochelle pour euh, tout, euh, toute euh, cette organisation. Cette nouvelle convention 2023-2027 doit également beaucoup à Jean-Michel Fournu qui est, euh, qui est là. Euh, et euh, donc, pour faire pas trop long, quand même quelques mots, notre projet, comme Julien l'a dit, euh, s'appelle à penser ensemble des avancées en matière de participation, des libérations euh, et les replis démocratiques. Poser le diagnostic que la démocratie est à refaire ne suffit plus. Il s'agit de penser les réponses démocratiques que les membres de la société peuvent elles-mêmes et eux-mêmes se donner. Le GIS fait le pari que l'analyse de ces expérimentations démocratiques, de ces dispositifs institués et de leur articulation, même paradoxale, demeure indispensable pour comprendre comment et à quelles conditions elles peuvent transformer les formes traditionnelles de domination politique. Pour les cinq années à venir, nous avons décidé d'organiser la réflexion du GIS en cinq axes donc, qui se décline dans le congrès euh, ces trois jours, avec cinq tables rondes et des ateliers euh, liés à ces tables rondes. On va très brièvement, pour terminer, décrire euh, ces cinq axes. Je vais décrire les trois premiers, Julien finira par les deux derniers. Premier axe, institutions et pouvoirs citoyens. Donc là, on poursuit les questionnements qui sont à l'origine du GIS en 2009. Euh, et donc, on va approfondir la compréhension de la manière dont les initiatives institutionnelles interrogent les fondamentaux de la démocratie, comme la question de la représentation le lien à la décision. La multiplication des formes de conventions citoyennes nous donne du grain à moudre. Un autre enjeu de cet axe est d'analyser les formes d'autonomie de la société civile dont les expérimentations participatives se développent. Quelques questions qu'on se pose ici. Quelle circulation et effet réciproque entre dispositifs institutionnels et pratiques citoyennes Dans quelle mesure l'offre privée ou civile de participation, c'est-à-dire des associations, des fondations, des entreprises, reproduit-elle les écueils de la participation instituée et puis, euh, comment penser les contributions démocratiques des formes de contre-pouvoir et leur reconnaissance, y compris en termes de financement public, par exemple. Deuxième axe, écologiser la démocratie, démocratiser l'écologie, que Jean -Michel, dans, dans lequel Jean-Michel est particulièrement investi, euh, autour des, du fait que les tensions contemporaines entre autoritarisme et démocratisation, entre politisation et dépolitisation, se donnent à voir avec une acuité particulière sur les questions environnementales, écologiques et climatiques. Avec les Gilets jaunes, à la Convention citoyenne sur le climat, on peut euh, plus généralement se demander si participation rime forcément avec transition écologique. Euh, quels sont les imaginaires et les émotions politiques et démocratiques liées aux transitions écologiques L'exercice d'une citoyenneté plus directement liée à la défense de l'habitabilité de la planète, l'élargissement de la communauté politique au-delà des humains, pour prendre en compte les générations futures et les communautés non humaines qui ne peuvent se représenter elles-mêmes, ouvrent de nouvelles questions et réclame de nouvelles institutions délibératives à inventer à toutes les échelles. Axe 3, produire démocratiquement des savoirs. Euh, alors là, produire démocratiquement des savoirs, ça passe pour commencer par une réflexion sur l'érosion de la légitimité des savoirs scientifiques, fragilisés sur le plan symbolique comme sur le plan budgétaire, et particulièrement les sciences sociales. Ça passe aussi par l'analyse des obstacles dressés à l'encontre des collectifs citoyens qui souhaitent contribuer à la production de connaissances sur la société. Il semble alors crucial de poursuivre les travaux sur les recherches participatives, sur les modalités de reconnaissance d'une diversité de savoirs dans la production des connaissances à la suite des épistémologies féministes et des épistémologies des sous. À l'heure des fake news amplifiées par leur circulation sur les réseaux sociaux, comment sont construits les faits sur lesquels on débat Peut-on délibérer quand tout le monde ne partage pas la même définition de la réalité Dans une démocratie des connaissances, comme l'appelle l'universitaire indien Shiv Visvanathan, on se donne les moyens de reconnaître la pluralité des savoirs et de garantir la possibilité de leur expression, de leur confrontation et de leur dialogue. Alors, Marion n'a pas, pas précisé, mais en fait, ces trois premiers axes, c'est des axes un peu historiques du, euh, du, 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 du GIS. 
le dernier, par exemple, sur lequel euh, elle-même a été très active ces dernières années, notamment avec l'espace euh, collaboratif Croiser les Savoirs avec tous et toutes. On ne va pas faire le bilan ce matin, en fait, des activités du GIS très riches euh, ces, ces dernières années. On y reviendra d'ailleurs plus euh, en détail, mais peut-être plus rapidement aussi, euh, demain soir à l'occasion euh, du, du cocktail ou auquel, au cours duquel vous êtes évidemment tous euh, et toutes chaleureusement euh, invités. J'en viens donc aux deux derniers axes qui sont pour le coup euh, plutôt des, des ouvertures et un élargissement par rapport euh, aux travaux, on peut dire, euh, historique du, euh, du GIS, quand bien même ils ont pu les, les toucher de façon euh, incidente. L'enjeu, nous semble-t-il, et ces axes-là ont vocation à structurer le travail du GIS aussi pour les, les années à venir. Euh, L'enjeu pour nous, c'est de peut-être euh, travailler plus, plus profondément en fait, ces, ces questions-là. Donc l'axe 4, euh, porte sur les liens entre économie, travail et démocratie autour de plusieurs questions. Et un des enjeux sera les modalités d'articulation et d'animation de ces, de ces axes. Euh, plusieurs questions, donc celle des liens entre néolibéralisme, financiarisation du monde et démocratie. Quelle part reste-t-il à la démocratie quand des pans entiers des, des, des décisions collectives sont soustraites à la délibération collective, justement, du fait du rôle d'institutions non élues, d'agences de notation, de contraintes et de limites cognitives et idéologiques c'est une des questions qui sera traitée euh, lors de la table ronde euh, animée par euh, Guillaume Gourde, je crois, euh, demain. Euh, je suis tout à fait au clair sur le, le programme. Cet axe a également vocation à structurer les réflexions du GIS autour des enjeux de la démocratie au travail, de démocratisation du travail, qui sont traduites ces dernières années par des travaux sur les coopératives, l'autogestion, les transformations de la démocratie sociale. On voudrait donner davantage de, de place à cela euh, à l'avenir. Et enfin... Et je le disais, hein, une des gageurs sera réussir à penser tout ça ensemble. C'est ça que cet axe a aussi vocation à s'intéresser en lien avec l'axe 1 qu'évoquait Marion, aux conditions matérielles de la participation, financement de la vie associative et de la démocratie participative, rôle des liens avec les financeurs publics et privés et incidence sur l'autonomie de la euh, participation. Enfin, dernier axe, euh, qui est probablement le plus nouveau, et de fait, on a reçu euh, assez peu de propositions en lien avec celui-ci, donc la participation entre démocratisation et autoritarisme. Il vise à s'interroger, c'est aussi en lien avec la thématique générale du, du colloque, hein, sur les usages des dispositifs participatifs par des régimes autoritaires, ou plus, plus, plus généralement leur usage à des fins de reproduction de l'ordre public ou de l'ordre social, pour reprendre la thématique d'un numéro de la revue de participation récent. Euh, cet axe vise aussi à interroger les dynamiques autoritaires qui travaillent les sociétés du Sud comme du, euh, du Nord global, au-delà de la seule démocratie participative, euh, je l'évoquais, criminalisation et répression des mouvements sociaux et des lanceurs d'alerte, attaque sur la séparation des pouvoirs et, et l'autonomie des médias, un ensemble de questions qui sont sous-jacentes à l'analyse des dynamiques participatives et qui seront notamment interrogées vendredi après-midi dans le cadre d'une euh, table ronde euh, spécifique. Euh, voilà, et donc ces, ces axes structurent nos, nos, nos trois jours de, de congrès via les tables rondes, mais aussi via les, euh, les, les, les panels. Je, je présente également, il y a également deux euh, ouvertures en soirée qui ont vocation à être, si ce n'est plus, plus informelles, en tout cas moins, moins académiques, avec la, la diffusion d'un documentaire sur l'expérience municipaliste de Saillant euh, ce soir, suivi d'un euh, débat, et puis euh, demain un débat sur l'expérience chilienne, je l'ai évoqué, euh, suivi du, euh, du, du, du cocktail. Donc un grand merci enfin à la MSH de nous de, de nous accueillir et un immense merci à ceux et celles sans qui ce second grain n'aurait pas été possible. Donc toute l'équipe du GIS Démocratie et Participation, Blandine Charrier, Guillaume Petit, Solène Tournu et Julie Pluinec. Euh, bah, sans qui vraiment rien n'aurait été possible. Vous avez certainement été en interaction et en contact avec eux pour pour, pour venir jusqu'ici. Donc vraiment un grand un grand merci et je crois qu'on peut les, les, les applaudir. Et on enchaîne tout de suite donc avec le premier temps de ce, de, de ce colloque. On a l'immense plaisir d'accueillir Jane Mansbridge, euh, tout droit venue de l'Université d'Harvard, euh, qui, qui sera discutée par euh, Yves Saint-Omer et, et Samuel Ayat. Je, je vous invite à vous installer euh, à, la, à, la, à la table. Euh, donc, euh, conférence inaugurale qui sera, euh, qui sera, qui sera réalisée et tous les échanges en, en, en anglais. Euh, et avec ce magnifique surtitrage qui va rester en français, ce qui euh, sera peut-être plus utile qu'actuellement. Euh, 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 voilà, donc, uh, so you, you want to, um, to stand right? Yeah. Uh, let's see about the PowerPoint. Et c'est toute la question de comment on fait pour avoir le PowerPoint et uh, à la fois les surtitres. Uh, on va y arriver. Uh, Donc là, on n'a plus le surtitrage. Donc c'est la question, Blandine, comment si, on fait Si, c'est bon. Ah, magnifique. Donc je vais juste... Euh... Voilà. 
Yep. Sure. I'm just going to say a few words uh, of presentation that have been uh, really, uh, really brief. Uh, so we are very, very glad to, to welcome this morning uh, Jane Mansbridge, uh, who is a, a professor of political science at uh, Harvard uh, University. Uh, she has uh, received uh, numerous awards. Uh, she has been uh, a few years ago president of the American Political Sci Science Association. And she's, uh, above all, uh, one of the most uh, influential and inspiring uh, uh, academic and thinker on democratic questions uh, in the last uh, decades. She's been working on uh, participatory and deliberative democracy, representation, the role of social movements. I feel something is happening behind me. <laughs> I can keep on. Je vais meubler un peu. Ah oui, ça passe plus rien du tout. C'est pas le livre qu'on voit Samuel. Ah merci. Uh, so Jane has published uh, uh, several uh, books and uh, and articles and chapters on on, on the question of democracy and, and deliberation and representation. Among uh, among them, uh, a first one, uh, Beyond Adversary Democracy, uh, in 1980. Uh, more recently, uh, Deliberative Systems in uh, 2012. And and uh, one of the reasons we're especially keen to uh, uh, invite and welcome uh, Jane is also uh, because we are uh, uh, recently we with uh, Samuel Ayat, who's been really the, uh, the, the master here of ceremony, but uh, edited a French translation of uh, uh, some of our uh, uh, Jane's uh, most uh, central uh, articles and, and, and chapters. Uh, we felt that, I mean, of course, uh, the work of Jane is already very well known among especially the people uh, in this room, uh, but it deserved probably a, a wider even uh, diffusion among uh, French uh, uh, academia and just this uh, this book can also uh, uh, be used as a kind of uh, uh, a manual and a textbook uh, uh, for classes uh, about uh, democracy, democratic theory. And uh, uh, you can have a look uh, at it uh, uh, on the table at the entrance. Uh, it was uh, published a few uh, months uh, ago. Uh, I think we're about to uh, uh, set up <laughs> the, uh, the technical uh, issue. We're very glad uh, to uh, 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 have with us uh, Yves Saint Omer and Samuel Ayat, who will uh, perform as uh, discussants. Uh, uh, Yves Saint Omer is a professor at Paris 8 University. He's been working uh, on several aspects of deliberative democracy and participatory democracy. I won't go over his long uh, resume. Uh, he made us a pleasure to do the uh, forward, uh, la postface uh, of this book, and just like to reflect on the contribution of Jane Mansbridge uh, to democratic theory. We're also very glad uh, to welcome Samuel Ayat, uh, who is uh, a permanent uh, research fellow at the CNRS uh, at uh, Sciences Po. Uh, Samuel uh, is working uh, in a political uh, theory. He's been working a lot this last years on uh, representation in uh, particular. Uh, uh, and uh, as I said already, he is uh, the editor of this, uh, of this translation of several of the, the works of Jane. So uh, Jane will uh, speak for about a half an hour and then Eve and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Samuel will uh, uh, open the discussion, react, discuss uh, 10 minutes each. And then we'll have a time of, of discussion, of exchange. Uh, you can uh, ask your questions both in French and English. Thanks a lot uh, to the uh, simultaneous uh, translation. Uh, we'll try, it's not my best, but to uh, uh, speak slowly. Uh, and I'm sure everything is going to be smooth from a technical perspective. Thank you very much, Jane. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, and thank you for um, letting me speak English. Uh, I wish I could be speaking with you in French. Um, uh, I thought I was speaking for 40 minutes. I just hear I'm th speaking for 30 minutes, um, and also to speak slowly. So those, those commands are, are slightly contradictory. 
uh, but I will do the very best I can. Um, so, and I will also try to make this thing work. Oh, the down one. Okay, great. Perfect. Um, also, this is in the way. So I'll, hmm. oh, that's, it's in the way up there too. Oh dear, 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 dear. Um, a few little mechanical, ah, uh, fantastic. Okay, so this, the, the idea here, um, the very foundation of, I think, the crisis in democracy today is that we human beings are becoming increasingly interdependent. And as we become interdependent, we're going to need more regulation for that interdependence, to, to manage that interdependence every time human beings come in contact. They need to have rules, they need to have ways of controlling themselves. And unfortunately, that increasing regulation is going to bring about increasing state coercion. So I think it's an inevitability. You may disagree with this, but I think it's inevitable that as we become more interdependent, we're going to need more state coercion. All of us hate state coercion, so that poses a problem. We need to legitimate that state coercion. We may need to make it as much as possible from us um, and not laissez We need to make it genuinely from us, not just manipulation to pretend it's from us. And our 18th century democracy, these mechanisms that we have left over from the 18th century are absolutely not sufficient for this new growth of state coercion. Back when those mechanisms were invented, it could make sense to say that government is best that governs least. That made sense. That was something people said. It was quite understandable. That's not true today. A government that governed least would be the government that gave over the forces of the world to raw capitalism, to raw war, war, and couldn't produce the internet or couldn't, couldn't ch help climate change, could do nothing about climate change, a government that governed least. So we, as we have, have moved along, becoming more interdependent, becoming therefore more regulated, needing ourselves to be more regulated, thereby bringing in more state coercion without much change in the means to legitimate that coercion, we have, of course, declining trust in almost every country, not every country, not Denmark, not every country, but in many, many countries, France, the United States, decreasing trust in government. And we, if we don't do anything about this, if we don't find ways to legitimate the government coercion better, we're going to have much reduced capacity to solve the central problems of interdependence, such as, for example, climate change. So what comes about through this decreasing trust? A set of things, and I'll just touch on two. One, uh, one good, one bad, one good. Authoritarian, quote unquote, backsliding comes in part from a frustration at not being heard, at needs not being perceived to be met. Authoritarian leaders claim, and not stupidly, they claim to some degree rightly to give voice to the people. Um, many right-wing parties have as a slogan, we say what you think. Things that you're, so to speak, not allowed to say in public, we will say for you. We will bring your voice forward. And um, Trump, for example, as uh, former President Trump in the United States, asked how he uh, did his, how he came up with his speeches. He said, I say a whole lot of things, and the ones that the audience likes, like, I say again. The ones they don't like, 
I don't say again. So to some fairly large degree, some of these authoritarian leaders are to some degree actually constituted by their own audience. They say what their audience wants them to say, and they are thereby giving voice to the people. And those of us who disapprove very strongly of these regimes need to understand that they are meeting real needs. If we want to undercut them, we have to meet those needs too. Um, in the course of the last couple of decades, as you all probably know, the left has lost the working class, not only in France, but in the United States, in the United Kingdom, and many other countries around Europe. Um, and that's come in part from not listening. So those are some of the bad things that this, that this inexorable growth of state coercion without sufficient legitimacy has produced. On the other hand, why are we all here? We're here because we believe in the possibility of democratic innovation. And there has been there a, a whole surge of democratic innovation that I'll be talking about today. That democratic innovation, in my experience, has been linked primarily to social justice goals, to equality goals, to wanting to empower the citizen. Uh, I think we all, um, probably many people in this audience have those goals. These democratic innovations have not been linked generally to the idea that we have here a state that must grow in power, and therefore we need, we need to legitimate it. We need to legitimate it from, uh, perceptually. We need people to perceive it to be legitimate, but we don't want to manipulate them. We want them to perceive it to be legitimate because it has become more legitimate. It has to be more normatively legitimate as well as perceived to be legitimate. So, if you agree with what I said, which you may not, uh, not do, uh, what are the implications? We need to accept the need for increasing state coercion. That's not fun. That is really not a pleasant message to deliver. Um, but I hope you'll take it seriously. Uh, and if that's the case, we need to focus on perceived legitimacy backed by normative legitimacy. And we need to focus on the recipients of coercion and even the beneficiaries of the state and improve those relations with the state. In order to make coercion more legitimate, you not only have to make the, uh, the input more legitimate, you not only have to make, to make the way the laws come about more legitimate, you also have to make the interactions between the state and the street more legitimate. The state and the entity, the people, the ordinary people who are being regulated, or even even the capitalists who are being regulated, um, you need to make those interactions more legitimate. Not just lazier coming down on you, but something that it, you can conceive of, conceive as from in a Rousseauian way, from me to me. How do we do that in twenty twenty two? Um, so, uh, one way I suggest is to increase uh, the descriptive representation of many, uh, many people who are being coerced, including uh, the working class, which we've tended to forget recently, both in the legislature and in the bureaucracy, because the administrative state is here to stay. It's something we need for this growing interdependence. We're not going to get rid of it, and we shouldn't, shouldn't try to get rid of it. Yet its legitimacy can't come entirely from the old standard voter votes for the legislature, the legislature appoints the representative, the, a bureaucrat, and the bureaucrat coerces the citizen. That's, that's too simple. That won't work anymore. That line of delegation is way, 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 way too long to carry enough legitimacy for the kind of coercion we have. So um, I think we need to, I'll go into some of this. We need to add increasing legitimacy to the function of the participatory mechanisms that we're, uh, we are trying to devise. So um, that's, this is just to sum up. Um, 
We need to accept the need for increasing state coercion because of this increasing interdependence. And it's not going to be easy for anyone, anyone on the political spectrum. It's certainly not easy on the left because we have been contre pouvoir all our lives. I'm on the left, so I speak from that perspective. Um, our, my life has been against power. So now to suddenly say, oh my God, we've got to, we've got to bolster power through genuine uh, normative legitimacy. Um, that's not easy for me to change. Um, the state also is based on capitalism, or is it can, could even be a tool of capitalism. In order to make the state legitimate, we have to reduce the power of capitalism. That's not easy. And anyone can see in, in daily life that very often the state uses too much coercion. It's clumsy. It's stupid. It's arrogant. Those things cannot just continue. Everyone here has to be part of trying to not just condemn it, but trying to figure out how to change it. So we must design the coercion to be minimal, and we must design it to protect and not crowd out voluntary solidarity and duty. I'm going to explain what I mean by that last point. Sometimes, if I had the time, I would have done uh, an experiment here. I would have loved to have done it. I just didn't have the time. But I would have given each of you a piece of paper, and I would have said, I'm endowing you with an imaginary 100 euros, and you can either give me the, all that 100 euros or zero, for simplicity. I'm going to double everything I get, and I will give it back to you equally. Now, if you think about that for a moment, you'll realize that everyone will go out with an equal amount of euros, whatever anybody gives me, doubled, divided among everyone equally. So everyone will go out with an equal amount, except those who have not given will go out with 100 euros more, because they'll have the 100 euros they had, plus what everybody else has given them doubled. So it would make sense for everyone not to give. If everyone doesn't give, you completely waste this resource. This is what's a common pool good. This is, this is a free use good. When I do this in my class, I find that about 65% give in, um, I teach at the Kennedy School at, at Harvard. So I find that, and I teach a course called Democratic Theory. Um, it's about half, three quarters international students. About 65% give in the 100. Um, and why do they do that? They do that partly out of a feeling of, a Kantian feeling of, well, what if everybody did this? I ought to do what I think that everyone should do. I want to, I make a universal maxim. The max, universal maxim would be give. If that's the universal maxim, I should give. So that's a duty. And then there's solidarity, which is these are, these are, you know, Eve, this is Eve, you know, this is Julian, this is, these are my friends. Of course I'm going to give, this, that's solidarity. So 65% are giving for those reasons. And that's what we need to keep any kind of collective going. We need that core of solidarity and duty. Why do you not throw your candy wrapper on the ground? Because you think, oh, it'll make the streets dirty, so you put it into your pocket. That's solidarity and duty. That's a feeling of belonging to, to a larger group, a feeling of some sort of obligation to that larger group. That's why many people pay their taxes, that's et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what makes most of the laws work. But there will sometimes be the 35% who didn't give. There'll sometimes be a, a group of people who uh, just don't give and, ta and, and take. Now, if you coerce them, Think of paying taxes. Many people will just pay their taxes because you have to make keep the state going, okay. But some people don't. So you coerce them. And that coercion actually produces a kind of protective shield for the people who are acting on, on duty and solidarity. Because if you did this exercise again in my class, fewer people would give the second time. Because there'll be there've been those people on the edge who were wondering, 
what to do. And then they think, okay, I want to be one of this. I want to be in the 35% this time. I gave last time. And it'll unravel. That, that core will not stay still if 35% are getting away with it. They'll feel like suckers. And so you, the, actually instituting the coercion creates an ecological niche for the duty and the solidarity to, to flourish. Now, obviously, to work and to be good, not just to be efficient, but also to be right, that coercion should be legitimate. So the implication is that we want to focus on this legitimacy, both the perceived and the normative. And that means, of course, that corruption, the ordinary just taking a, I'm not being fancy about corruption, I just mean the simple venal corruption. It's terrible. It completely undermines legitimacy. And it's extraordinarily neglected in normative theory. It's neglected in qualitative and quantitative empirical political science. I don't mean to say that no one's studying it. There are a great good number of wonderful people studying it. But if, if I were to ask you what are the four problems, if, right as you walked in the door, what are the, sort of the four problems of, of today that are most important after naming climate change and authoritarianism, you might name a couple of others. I would guess that practically no one in this room would name corruption. And yet, corruption, if you think about the big problem is legitimating government coercion, corruption is very important. Um, explanation. When the, when the state hits the street, when a bureaucrat is coercing a, a citizen, explanation goes a tremendously long way. And we can be quite inventive about ways of ways of bringing authority, getting authorities to explain. And we can also train authorities to explain. Some of you may have a few, may plan to have jobs in government. Maybe you already have jobs in government. Well, put the word explain over your bed so that when you get up in the morning, you see explain. The explaining goes a tremendously long way to, uh, to legitimating if it's a genuine explanation, not a manipulated one. And I'll come to recursivity in a moment. Um, street level bureaucracy, also neglected. Generally, for a long time in political science in the United States, not so much in France, uh, because you have the Grands Ecoles, but, um, but in the United States, uh, of course, back in the 30s, administration was very important. But then it became not so important in political science. Luckily, there's a whole new group of young scholars that are getting interested in both the street level of administration and the policy level of administration. And, and that's great because that's where the future lies. And the societal level is also neglected. I'll come to some of this. Because I want to talk about the goal of recursivity. And by recursivity, I mean that both elected legislators and bureaucrats should in the ideal, and this is an aspirational ideal, not one we're ever going to really reach, just what a standard toward which to aim. The ideal would be that the representative should be in, a, in an ongoing communicative relationship, a mutually responsive communicative relationship where the legislator or the administrator gets a chance to explain the reasons for the rules and the citizen gets a chance to say that the rules are crazy, that they don't fit the situation. Um, and then back again, well, why, are the, you know, why did this happen? Can both sides mutually explain this coercion that both of them, that one has to uh, administer and the other has to uh, get? Um, so uh, exp explanation, listening. So here's the standard ideal. I said it before, the voter votes for the representative. The representative appoints the administrator. The administrator coerces the citizen. And the recursive ideal would be that the citizen and the elected representative would be, be able to have some sort of mutual communication, not just I vote for you or I shout at you, my slogans, and the, and the representative goes on the, has an ads on TV and so forth, not just one way, one way, one way, but recursive. That would be the ideal. And the say, say, representative would have a recursive relationship with administrators, and the administrators would have a recursive relationship with citizens. 
And that would be administrators at the, at the policy level and, and also at the street level. And then those groups would also have recursive relationships with societal representatives. And by that, I mean unions or NGOs of other sorts. There are many, many organizations in society that have set them up to rep selves up to represent some sector of society. Of course, it's very unequal. The rich have many, many more. Capital has many, more, much more in the way of associations than uh, labor or ordinary citizens. Um, but what we should try to make that much, much, much more equal. Um, but as we do, we want recursive relationships. And what we don't have now, not, not many people think about it, is recursive relationships between the, those uh, societal organizations and those they claim to represent. So unions, for example, um, often represent their workers relatively well. What they don't have usually is recursive relationships with their workers. So that in the EU, for example, the construction unions might make some sort of, be part of negotiations with the EU in regard to the road building. And they, the unions agree to X, Y, Z regulation. They don't then explain to their workers why these regulations, what, what good they do, or why they why the union had to agree, agree to them, what the union got in return for agreeing to things that the workers didn't wouldn't want, um, that that kind of explanation doesn't go on, and nor is there much chance. Since some unions are, are a little different, but not, nor is there much chance then for the workers to say, "This rule is really stupid." When I go and try to build a road, and you tell me I can't do A, B, C, and D. That just completely gets in the way of trying to build the road. You know, I get exhausted because I'm only et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Any kind of thing that the worker might want to say back, there's very little recursive um, uh, uh, capacity in these societal organizations. Um, and citizens should talk with citizens. Now, there's some ways in practice that we've that sort of participatory innovations have, have, have kind of come just invented in the last couple of years um, for to increase recursivity in the US and, uh, and with a couple of representatives in Australia. Um, what, what they've done at Ohio State uh, is to um, bring together 175 citizens who randomly selected on the, on the internet to have an hour conversation with their representative about some important issue like terrorism or immigration. And there's questions and answers back and forth. Um, and the, um, then it's only an hour, but, but the participants like this very much and the, and the uh, representatives learn. Now, if every representative in the United States gave an hour a week to such a session, at, well, actually twice a week, one hour twice a week, um, for six years, after six years, that representative would have had these recursive sessions with a quarter of their constituents. If you institutionalize something like this, every person in the United States, every citizen in the United States could have had such a conversation at least once in their lifetimes. They, people talk about these with their friends. So it, it's not just the one person who was involved. It's also they talk to one and a half other people. It's hard to talk to a half another person, but um, they managed to do it. Um, they, so it's not just the person themselves, but it's who they talk with. It, it, could, it could spread an understanding um, and a way of getting the representatives to understand what's happening with the constituents throughout the country. Oh, yes, thank you, sorry. Um, and um, when they've tried this, uh, they actually have had, get a pretty good random sample. The only thing that's oversampled is um, parents with uh, children in the house and unemployed. You can imagine those are the people who might be able to sit by a laptop and take an hour to talk with their representative. That's not the worst overrepresentation in the world. Later, the people who've done this are more likely to vote, they're more likely to talk about politics, and they're enthusiastic about the experience. The representatives take this seriously, and they distribute and publish their responses afterwards. In Germany, there's a different kind of recursivity. Um, the 
the single district representatives in Germany that you know they have a double system proportional representation and single districts those single district representatives are now allowed to have many publics of 30 or more constituents come together for a day they're paid on an issue of the representative's choice to deliberate and suggest solutions that's only 30 people um, and we don't have a stu any studies of this. It's brand new. Um, so we'll want to know how representative are these 30 people. That's a very small number. Um, and how are they planning to get them? What we know now is that poor people will get letters in the mail saying, do you want to be part of a, uh, a representative group? Throw the letter away, just they, like they throw away. You know, most, most of us throw away these things they come in, you get stuff in the mail, it just goes down. Um, similarly, phone calls. How many phone calls do you answer from someone who's not your friend? You hang up. There's about a 9% response rate now in the United States to things. Um, so what you really need to do is you, not, you need to knock on doors, and the best thing to do is not to have university students knock on doors, but have peers, people from the same community, knock on doors and explain. This is a random sample, and you've been chosen, and if you don't go, People like you may not be represented. You have, we need you to represent people just like yourself. Um, now, these forms of citizen participation are top down. That, that is to say, they are open to manipulation. Um, they're not. They're not spontaneous, bottom up. They're run by the government. So we have to keep an eye on them and and, and make sure that these are done relatively well and that the representatives really want to learn as has been the case so far because the representatives who volunteered to do these things you can imagine are the nice nice representatives who genuinely really want genuinely want to hear from the citizens this gets institutionalized you can see that it could become a manipulative tool so we need to um we need to keep an eye on it um now, it, let's take stakeholder groups. The EU consults extensively. That's how it creates its legitimacy. It doesn't get its legitimacy very much from the votes. The, the legitimacy it has, it gets through negotiations that all stakeholders agree to. Um, but of course, those stakeholder groups are extremely biased. Capital is heavily represented. Um, now, it's possible of long ago, a guy named Philipp Schmitter uh, recommended that citizens be able to be given 10 vouchers and spread them among the organizations of their choice. You could give all 10 to, uh, to climate change groups, or you could give uh, one to a feminist group, one to a climate change group, one to this, one to that, spread them out, whatever you want to do with your 10. And then those votes, those vouchers, would then fund the organizations, A, the organizations would have to be internally democratic, but also this, they would be the organizations that the state would would talk with in these negotiations. It was an attempt to make neo-corporatism more uh, legitimate and more democratic. We don't have that. No one's ever thought of, of actually doing that. I, I found it attractive. Um, but what, what we know now is these societal groups have very little recursivity with their constituents. Why is that? Two reasons, of course. Um, if you're running things, you don't want to be bothered by somebody telling you to do something else. But also, it's expensive. It's expensive to t spend time talking with constituents. Um, now, in, in the practice, street-level bureaucracy is going to be very important. Um, and we could take for Denmark, for example, as a as a, as a standard, there's great attention there to the quality of the interaction, that, that the interaction between the state bureaucrat and the recipient of, of beneficiary of, 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 of good things from the state, but also the person coerced, should understand you want to reduce resentment, you want to increase respect, and you want very much to honor the autonomy of the citizen. Those are the goals. So, not only accept the need for state coercion, 
not only focus on perceived and normative legitimacy, focus on the recipients of the coercion, and increase descriptive representation. Um, yes, D redesigning the street level interactions. The new public management, which had a fl flourished for about oh, 20 years or so, had in some sense the right idea. There, the right idea was that these more interactions, street level interactions, should be driven by the citizen. Except the problem was that they thought about it, they had the good goal, but their means were to treat citizens like clients in the market. They, they just simply borrowed from the market the mechanisms of interacting. They, had, they ha didn't have a clue about citizenship qua citizenship. Um, they didn't didn't understand that you could draw on. You remember when I did that that exercise in my class? Sixty five percent contributed. Sixty five percent acted like citizens. Um, Sixty five percent did so because they felt they belonged to a group or that they should. We can draw on that um, if we have a good state. If the coercion is genuinely legitimate, we can draw on those feelings of citizenship. We can. We can build them. We can act. If if the, if you are a state bureaucrat, if you're going to be one of you going to be a state bureaucrat ever, uh, you can make respect your watchword. Not just exp explain above your bed when you wake up in the morning. Put respect uh, above your bed in the morning. Um, and new public management uh, just threw all that out the window. Not most of that out the window. So you can redesign this. And you want both minimal coercion and you want to reduce crowding out. Do I have any explanation of that? Let me see. No. Crowding out. Um, you want to design the coercion so that the external coercion doesn't replace the internal motives. Um, many, some of you will know the long line of, of social, of uh, so social psychological. Uh, research that shows that if you start to pay people for something that they they like to do, when you stop paying them, they'll stop doing it, even though they actually like to do it, because they redefined what it is that they were doing as something they get paid for. So you crowd out the internal motivation. I like playing jigsaw puzzles, and so when I sit in the waiting room, I'll just play jigsaw puzzles. Then you pay some people to play jigsaw puzzles, put them back in the waiting room, and they don't play jigsaw puzzles anymore. The ones that you haven't played are there enjoying themselves, making the jigsaw puzzles. But the ones you paid to do jigsaw puzzles, now they're back in the waiting room. They don't do them because they redefine jigsaw puzzles as something you get paid for. The external motivation is crowded out the internal motivation. I pay my taxes because I'm forced to. Crowds out, I pay my taxes because I want to be a good citizen. So you have to de redesign, for example, my work. If I got paid $5 an hour for every, $5 per word for every word I wrote, I'd wake up in the morning and say, okay, you know, uh, I'm going to write 100 words today, that'll be $500. And I write five, 500 words. Uh, it's quite different from waking up and thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to give that talk tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow. Um, what am I going to say to people? What, what's important for me to say? Okay, I'm going to pour out 500 words. Um, I'm behind that. The co but if you pay me and you say, Jenny, we want you to talk and we'll give you an honorarium of $1,000 or something. By the way, your, the talk should be about 500 words. Then you've redesigned it so that it's a kind of honor. And then I'm ready to go. So you can actually change the mixture of incentives by framing them differently. We have to think quite a lot about as we increase coercion, that that coercion doesn't drive out the most important duty and solidarity that makes things go. And I've talked a bit about the descriptive representation. Why is it so important to have in the legislature? The Communist Party used to have a rule that all of its members in the legislature had to come from working class backgrounds. Of course, they were no longer working class. Usually by the time they uh, reached the legislature, some of them had, had even gotten law degrees and so forth. 
but they came from working class backgrounds. Why was that important to the Communist Party? It was important because somebody in the legislature will notice things that someone from a working class background won't notice. And then there's the communicative factor. When that, co when, when that coercion needs to be explained, it will be explained in the right language, with the right accent, with, the, with, a, with a mutual understanding. And when the coerced person, if the coerced person is working class, says A, B, C, D, E, F, G, this is a bad idea, that other working class person will be able to understand not just the words, but the nuance in a way that a professional class person would not, um, you know, think, well, right, I won't go into my call. Um, so there's signals of likeness, and then there's the shared experience. I know what you're talking about. An elected legislator can say, I know what you're talking about. Um, and that's true both with the legislature and it's true with the administration, and it's true in societal groups. Many, many societal groups, even those uh, designed to help um, XYZ members of, of the public, have got professionals uh, in their top echelons um, who sometimes don't have the capacity to communicate very well with their, their own clients. Now, another implication would be um, to um, add increasing the legitimacy of state coercion to the function of participatory me mechanisms. Now, many of you are here because you're really interested in participatory democracy and you're interested in it for social justice and equality reasons. The idea that you would use these mechanisms to legitimate state coercion may not be ter tremendously um, palatable to you, may not be something very attractive to you. But I think that, that is an important function, nevertheless, in my um, And I'm going to go quickly through the, some of the participatory mechanisms. There's social movements. And social movements are fantastic um, democratic mechanisms because they're open to, this, they're open to spontaneity. They're bottom up. They're the most bottom up mechanism we have. Um, and also, they're what, uh, what some people call, I call, hydra headed means they they have many usually they have many many incarnations in many many different local contexts and some of those incarnations can actually be within the same social movement uh, at, uh, against one another at loggerheads as we say uh, they can this part of the social movement can really disagree basically with that part of the social movement but although it's not unified fully unified that disagreement is its strength because it means that those people here have a place in the social movement, and those people there have a place in the social movement. And even though they're disagreeing, they're all part of it. And that means that the social movement can respond to all sorts of idiosyncratic local needs and uh, perceptions. Um, so in some ways, it's most egalitarian of all mechanisms. But there's some problems with social movements, and one I'm going to call, the reason I put quotation marks around funding is it, it, it's not just a matter of funding but because the end that the social movement is going to uh, is aiming at is a little bit like that money in the experiment anybody will get it whether they're they've contributed to it or not it's a free use good so if you're going to get the benefit whether you've contributed to it or not Who's going to be who's going to be active in the movement? Well, it'll be the young people who have a little bit more time, and also because social movements are fun, they're a way of meeting people. But it'll also be particularly people who care very, very deeply about the topic. Well, people who care very, very deeply about the topic are not typical of the rest of the population, and if people who care very, very deeply about the topic, talk to one another, they'll excite one another, they'll incite one another, they'll get each other to want to do more, and they'll egg each other on in ways that make them even more different from the public. And sometimes that means that then when they hear information from outside, they're deaf to it because they've created their own little world. 
kind of fully a social movement, a, the, a, a world in which they're talking only to one another. I wrote a book about this, um, at any rate, uh, Why We Lost the Equal Rights Amendment, it was called, um, about a movement that I was part of where I saw this dynamic of deafness, where we were talking only to one another and didn't listen to the opponents. We, we, had, we, had, we had arguments we could have made to the opponents, but we didn't make them. Um, now, sometimes um, th we, can, we can get around this um, through, uh, if, if a social movement happens to be funded from outside, for example, the Communist Party in the United States was funded to some degree by the, um, uh, by the Soviet Union, and that made possible something like the Daily Worker. The Daily Worker newspaper had a lot of genuine worker contribution in it. Of course, it had the articles that were done by, by intellectuals in the cities, but it had many, many letters to the editor and so forth that were from workers themselves. And it was a mechanism in which workers could talk with workers. Now, we, maybe we can get this with social media today because it's free, but at that point, newspapers cost money. You know, we have to print them and so forth. Um, and, with, and it was made possible by a little funding from the USSR. So with no funding, the people who contribute will not be typical. And that goes to the deafness. Now also, social movements work best, I think, by changing norms and changing, maybe even, maybe even being like the feminist movement, changing some of the structures of interpersonal domination, um, civil rights movement, environment. You can think of the nor nor immense norm changes that we brought about. And even the Tea Party, which was funded by billionaires, worked a lot by norms. But there's a strong indirect effect on the state. But there isn't as much direct effect on the state. When an organization forms from a social movement, I don't know what social movements you belong to, but when an organization forms, I think you'll notice that not everybody in the social movement joins the organization. Very few people become dues-paying members of an organization. And the, that means that the organization will be relatively small. It'll have relatively little power over the state. So um, unless you go to that Schmitter uh, idea that voters can, can choose their organizations at election time and fund them through the state, um, you, you, social movements have a, very, have a wonderful effect on the larger norms, but have a tenuous relationship on state coercion, with state coercion. So, um, now supposing, nevertheless, you could get organizations and so forth. My goal, increasing the legitimacy, increasing the legitimacy of um, state coercion. Can you imagine that as a goal of social movements, really? Um, you know, think of the social movements that you're in, and then uh, Jenny Mansbridge comes up and says, Oh, everyone, I want to say at this meeting that we should really make increasing the uh, legitimacy of state coercion a major goal of our organization. I don't think this would go over very well. Um, so I'm not sure, sure, sure that that's uh, an appropriate goal for social movements. Um, social movements don't seem to be all that great at challenging economic power either, um, because for that you need the state. Um, so. Um, but there are some possible real world um, examples, and some of you might want to study Latin America. I don't know enough about Latin America, but there's, there's a there there's quite an implication of social movements in the state. It's quite possible that the way they're doing things in Latin America does increase the legitimacy of the state, um, and we have to look at that. Uh, working class organizing is another place we might look. These are possibly researchable questions. Um, so if it doesn't work in social movements, it might work in referenda. Yes, it does. Referenda do increase the legitimacy of state coercion unquestionably. Uh, of course, there's many problems with them, and I recommend you know some of the literature on that. Citizen assemblies, I think, do have a possibility of increasing the legitimacy of state coercion. Um, particularly if they supplement, not replace, elected representation. There's a big uh, literature now on that. 
I take the stance of supplementing, not replacing elected representation. Um, and current citizen preferences are for assemblies that are large, that are supermajority, and that are advisory, um, not that supplement the legislature. Now notice the word current citizen preferences. Those citizens, once we, once we begin to live with these randomized deliberative citizens assemblies brought together but with a randomized group of citizens who deliberate and make recommendations, it's quite possible that in 20 years um, we'll get used to them and we'll like them and we'll have gotten over some of the problems with them. Um, and people will be happy to say, no, let, no, let's empower them in one way or another. Um, we're beginning to empower them by saying, uh, for example, in East Belgium, there they've said, if a citizens' assembly comes up, it's the citizens' assembly is commissioned by the legislature. If they come up with recommendations, we, the legislature, promise to implement those recommendations or give a public justification why not. But not totally empowered, but on the way to empowerment. This is the way things may go, but currently these, these are advisory, and they increase the legitimacy of the law um, by adding the citizenry. Um, now, to make those citizens' assemblies really work, um, you still need better representation. If those of you who have been involved with these citizens' assemblies, you'll know that um, you need stratification as well as just randomly selected. And you should stratify not just on uh, male, female, education, age, locale, geographic locale, those obvious things, but you should also stratify on the basis of attitudes on the issue. So if the issue is about climate change, if the citizens are coming together to discuss climate change, you don't want the people who are um, pro, um, who are uh, against climate change to be more than they are in the population. You want to have much more of a sample of the population so you get the dissidents, you get the people who, who don't give a damn about climate change as well as the people who care very much. Because random selection, most people don't agree to be in the assembly. They, they'll be randomly selected. But of the people who are randomly selected, it's the people who care who go. So it's not actually a, 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 a perfect mirror of the population. So you need to pay. Uh, you're not gonna get poor people unless you pay. And the appropriate amount is half again the minimum wage. You need supports like childcare and disability, translation. Um, and you need what invitations, door to door convincing um, by your peers saying, we need you to represent people like you. And we all need to experiment and see, see how we can get better representation. And we need a better link with the public. For example, if the legislature is involved, that's a great link to the public because the newspapers will report it, the television will report it. And I think there's been some work on how you should publicize these results. Right now, if you, any of you have ever looked at the results of citizens' assemblies, it's often X percent thought something or other at the beginning, and now Y percent think something at the end. The reports don't much go into the reasons. Um, and my own little hope is that someday that they'll devise a way in which you can, students or any uh, volunteers can videotape the people who've changed their minds before they leave the hall, before they leave the weekend, and say, why did you change your mind? And get people to, who participate, citizens, who've changed their mind to say why they changed their mind in the course of the assembly. That, I think, is what someone who wasn't part of the assembly can relate to. At the moment, an ordinary citizen doesn't know what his or her relationship is to these randomly selected people. Why should I care what these randomly selected people think? But if you have people, ordinary people, saying why they changed their minds, that might help. So that's a different direction to go in. To go in. Um, having some of the members of the assembly be ambassadors to the public, go out and talk on the television, go out and talk in their local districts. Um, and schools could educate the citizens about the assemblies. This, I think, I think citizens' assemblies have really a, gr a great um, potential uh, to 
legitimate the laws, both genuinely by bringing input into the laws normatively and also in perceived legitimacy. So, um, and you have to have better facilitation than there is is now. You have well, it's pretty good facilitation, but you really need to bring out the voices of people who normally don't speak. Um, so that's it. Um, the argument goes like this: this increasing interdependence is going to lead to increasing regulation. It has to. Then that means that you're going to have to have more concern for the common good, more duty and solidarity, but you're also going to have more state coercion. And if you do have more state coercion, which I think is the foundation of my argument, is that this is coming. It's going to it's going to be there, and it's going to be there for good reasons. We need to be more. Uh, we need to increase that legitimacy, and the mechanisms can in include this recursive representation in both the elected and administrative and societal realms, that it can include referenda, it can include deliberative citizens' assemblies. So, in short, for those of you who are going to go on in research, those of you who are going to go on in as, as people taking any kind of position in the state, those of you who are going to go on as activists in the world, I'm arguing, and you may not agree with me, that increasing the normative and perceived legitimacy of state coercion should be a central goal in our research and in our practical action. And I think we should add that goal to the function of some of today's uh, participatory mechanisms. So, is that a good conclusion to draw? I, I, I know it's, it's not something that's a lot of fun, the idea that we should add increasing the legitimacy of state coercion uh, to, uh, to, our, to our agenda. Uh, make it central, but I hope you will th think it. So here's the logo of your c conference, uh, the falling apart of the democracy. And so what I'm doing, doing my best to prop it up. So. Est-ce que le sous-titrage marche ou est-ce que tu l'as en Il me semble. Permettez le sous-titrage. Here it is. C'est bien comme ça ou pas Si éventuellement quelqu'un peut venir nous aider sur le, le rétablissement du sous-titrage, ça pourrait être utile, euh, étant même relativement incompétent de ce point de vue-là. Peut-être que malgré tout, vu qu'on est déjà bien en retard, on peut peut-être commencer quand même. OK. Um, so, uh, first of all, uh, I want to thank uh, Gis uh, for this invitation to discuss uh, Jenny Mansbridge. Uh, as you all know, uh, she is a major author on participation, deliberative democracy, deliberation and participation, deliberation and representation, a systemic approach to deliberative democracy. I mean, a huge range. Of, of topics on which she has been a crucial author. Um, what is also quite interesting with Jenny is that she's able to couple empirical and normative theory, uh, to couple empirical research and non-ideal political theory. And I think that in this perspective, a plaidoyer for including practitioners in the conversation and uh, academics in the action is also something very valuable. Uh, in addition, I mean, this is a personal statement, but I think that her ethics uh, is, is great and that for all these reasons, uh, Jenny is a grand dame of uh, the uh, participatory field of research. Um, 
excuse me, he's calling me Jenny. I noticed my name is Jane, but he's calling me Jenny. That's my nickname. I invite all of you to call me Jenny. Uh, as I understood your, your talk, uh, you have developed five main messages, and I have three questions or doubts. The so first is we have to accept more coercion because there is a growing interdependency uh, between us. The second message is a normative goal. Because we have to accept more state coercion, we have to give a higher priority for a normatively legitimate state coercion. And ecology is one example on which we should have this more legitimate state coercion. The third message is that the left, and perhaps also a lot of political sociologists, uh, have to integrate these, but uh, are not well prepared because they use to criticize the state, not to increase uh, the legitimacy of state action. A fourth a message is that we have to go towards a system of participation and deliberation. Uh, Participation is a democratic way, it's not the only one, which allows us to increase the legitimacy of state coercion. We have, in this perspective, social movements, referenda, institutional uh, participation such as uh, citizen assemblies, and we have to couple all of these different kinds of participation in order to go to this goal. And the, the last message, uh, for me at least, is that we have also to go toward a system of representation with a strong dimension of descriptive representation, but also recursive uh, representation, uh, namely uh, communication between representative and constituencies. So I have three questions. The first one is about your main claim about the legitimate state coercion. We have a growing interdependency. This is right but it goes much beyond state level. The global governance uh, means also a reduced capacity of state action, at least in most countries. It may not be the case in the US. It may not be the case for the Chinese state, but for most states, you can't really act efficiently alone. And you have to behave in a world in which international organizations, transnational organizations, private uh, companies, corporations, um, and so on and so forth, are contributing to the production of the norms to which we should obey. So it, ma it makes it much more difficult to legitimize state action in this world. Uh, how do we do it? Um, in addition, uh, I think that what is your most important contribution to the field of participation research is to propose a non-ideal normative theory. We have to deal with the real world and develop normative goals for this real world in order to know where we should go. And in this real world, the state has two faces. There is a bright face and the dark face. You rightly underline the bright face without the state we want tame capitalism. So again, say libertarian or anarchist view, we need the state. But you do not develop the other face of the state, the dark side, which could be developed again, say Durkheim, against the French republicanism, against a developmental state in the South, namely the idea that the state is also a crystallization of power struggles, of relations of domination, and that the states at the same time do protect the weakest, but also stabilize an unjust order. I mean, Gramsci was speaking of uh, uh, coercion and consent, and I think we are still in this real existing world, real existing world, with the states with two faces. So we, we have to, to develop a, a contradicting task 
enhancing the legitimacy of the good state action and contested bad state action. Uh, so what is left? This is my second question. What is a left politics in this world? I mean, for sure, we have to uh, have uh, political parties who will be able, political representatives who will be able to uh, influence state action. We have to develop democratic innovations such as citizen assemblies in order to increase the dialogue uh, between the state and citizens, this recursive representation. But we also have to accept strong protestations of the state, uh, civil disobedience, um, movement of protests, to some extent, rage and hunger alone are self-consuming, but deliberation alone is powerless. And we have to couple these two dimensions of citizen participation, and this is not easy. We have to couple deliberative and radical democracy, and this is not easy. And in addition, unless we think that it is realistic to have a global world revolution in the next decade, we also have to deal with the green finance, with the green capitalism, which is to a large extent uh, window dressing, but to the other extent, uh, we need this uh, uh, and we need a green capitalism as we needed a welfare state capitalism in the past century. So we are in the presence of a, a system which is like an ecosystem with predators and prey, constant evolutions, a very fragile equilibrium, invasive spaces, strong tensions, asymmetries, and in this context, just focusing on increasing state legitimacy uh, seems to be uh, not enough. And invasive spaces in this ecosystem can be democratic or not democratic, and one of the most interesting inputs of this uh, conference will be to study also the authoritarian trend which goes on together with the participatory trend. My last question. Uh, to some extent, uh, my claim is that uh, what Mao called the mass line in the last century was the paradigm of recursive representation in the 20th century. Mao wrote in 1943, in all the practical work of our party, all correct leadership is necessary from the masses to the masses. This means take the ideas of the masses and concentrate them, then go to the masses and propagate and explain these ideas until the masses embrace them as their own, hold fast to them and translate them into action and test the correctness of these ideas in such action. Then once again concentrate ideas from the masses and once again go to the masses so that the ideas are perceived in and carried through and so on over and over again in an endless spiral uh, with the ideas becoming more correct, more vital and richer each time. Such is the Marxist theory of knowledge to some extent, much beyond Mao and Maoism. I think this kind of recursive representation was typical of the socialists, the communists, but also to some extent, the Christian Democrats in uh, Western Europe and to a lesser extent, perhaps in, in the US. This is over now. So what do we do now? And I see your attempt to propose a uh, discursive representation as uh, an objective, uh, as the attempt to replace what used to be recursive representation in the 20th century by a new kind of recursive representation. Est-ce que je peux prendre ta place, ma chère amie? Yes, I, je fais tout comme, comme Yves. Quand il m'a dit un PowerPoint, ah, mais il ne m'avait pas dit qu'il y avait des images. Il ne m'a pas dit qu'il y avait des images dans le PowerPoint. Maintenant, je me sens que j'ai un PowerPoint. Mais, um, ok, merci beaucoup so uh, pour for ce talk. La plupart de mes commentaires, en fait, seront um, largement similaires à ceux d'Yves, donc nous pouvons 
uh, we can save uh, a bit of time. And I think I, I start, I, so I have three points which uh, will all end with, with a question. And the first one is um, that I think you make a very convincing, convincing case in favor of coercive state power, but uh, it's not clear over whom uh, this state power should be reinforced. Uh, is it power over citizens, power over factions? And uh, of course, the answer is always contingent to the situation. In some situation, you need power over factions uh, and so on and so forth. Um, but with climate change, we see that it seems to me that the free riders, mostly it's not citizens, it's not factions, it's capitalist firms. They are the one over, with, uh, over which you should increase state power. Um, but there, there is a problem here, because even if historically states uh, have been exactly like the place, uh, the, the apparatus that could exert uh, coercive power over firms, uh, in a globalized capitalist system, it's very complicated to do so because uh, it, they can evade coercion by going to other states and, you know, capital flows. So in order to have state coercion over firms, you need to give states huge disproportionate, disproportionate power. You, you should give states, uh, you know, control over private property, control over international transfers of goods, of people, control over the internet, where a large part of the economy is located. So if you want to succeed in giving state, in giving power, uh, enough power to states for them to control firms, you give them huge power. But you have absolutely no guarantee that this power, it's something that Eva said, it will be used over the correct actors and not over the populations. And so uh, the question is, uh, you know, how do you give this sort of disproportionate coercive power to states over firms uh, while preventing them to use this power over uh, their citizens, their political opponents, uh, other factions, and so on and so forth. A second, yeah, a second question is that, uh, in my opinion, more, more deeply, in globalized capitalist systems, not only do states do not have enough power against firms, but they do not want to use this power when they have it because they compete to get capital. So they have to actually they have an incentive. Uh, through capitalism to be less and less coercive uh, to our, towards firms. And there's a, a sort of competition between states to be the less possible coercive uh, towards capital. So how can we make states not only have coercive, legitimate coercive power, but use this power uh, over firms? And uh, a first way to do so in, in your presentation that, that you mentioned several times is uh, working class organizations. Uh, historically, it is through these working class organizations that uh, they exerted coercion over the state in order for the state to exert coercion over firms, or may, sometimes they did it directly through organizations. But to do that, and you mentioned it, you mentioned it in, in your talk, it requires very strong working class parties and very strong trade union. Whereas everywhere, these working class uh, parties and unions, they have largely not disappeared, but faded in, in many ways. And this is due to, to many different factors. Uh, and you mentioned the lack of recursive representation. And it, it strikes me as very strong. It's true that unions, trade unions, do not uh, uh, do not represent enough. But the problem is one of the reasons there is no recursive representation. It's not only the fault of the union and parties. It's also because people do not represent themselves necessarily as members of the working class. Like if you look at the protests of of, of the uh, last decade, uh, you had lots of popular movements, and largely, you know, workers were in there. But they did not act as workers, as members of the working class. And so what, what do you do from the side of trade unions and parties when even if you want to do recursive representation, 
you do not have the subject, you do not have a representative subject, you do not have a constituent that uh, symbolically represents itself as the working class, you know. Uh, and so what, what can you do with this discrepancy between what you try to represent and how people actually represent themselves? And a third question or is uh is is about ngos i know it, it sounds very I, I i don't know not very leftist to say so but maybe it, one of the things that maybe is a, a solution is that states have accepted actually coercion over them to a certain part they have accepted to surrender parts of their sovereignty to international treaties and international organizations uh, I don't know why exactly they did so, but it seems that there is something here. Like in conference of parties, they we can say it's not enough, but they seem to discuss. The problem is this, in these forums, the question of representation of citizens uh, is complicated because citizens are represented by states uh, because states usually claim to represent their citizens, but uh, they lack a proper channel of representation. And they have one maybe through uh, NGOs uh, who have at least, they have strong representative claims. They make representative claims of the time. But the problem is uh, they have no coercive power whatsoever. So they are accepted in these forums. They, their representative claims are validated mostly by the uh, uh, international organizations, but they do not hold any power by their own. And, so my question would be, uh, you know, how to give power. So maybe you do not speak a lot about NGOs, but I think that with this idea of representation that you uh, that, that that you mobilize, maybe there's something. How to empower these unelected representatives, these unauthorized representatives in these forums, and more importantly, how to do so democratically? Because now mostly it's appointment by by the organization. So sorry, these are very, three very uh, general questions, but um, thank you once again very, very much uh, for, for, for your talk. I'm looking forward for, to your answers. Oh my. Thank you to all of you uh, guys. It was really fascinating. Just like we're kind of running out of time, uh, I, I suggest we go until 11.30. Just like if there is one or two just like present and, and really short questions or comments, it's possible. And then I'll give you back the floor, Jane, to uh, just like wrap up in about 10 minutes. I mean, I know your, your plate is pretty full already, but if you are, there is one or two questions, it's, it's possible. Uh, so let's take it. If I manage to reach you, uh, there you go. Oui, merci beaucoup. Uh, je vais parler en français. Je remercie les organisateurs de m'avoir uh, permis cette facilité. Euh, je suis tout à fait convaincu par la, la, le concept de représentation récursive. Je, je, je pense que effectivement, ça ne va pas dans le très bon sens. Euh, je me demande simplement si euh, le bien public euh, dont vous parlez, euh, il n'est pas conçu trop comme évident en lui-même, euh, puisque la machine à dupliquer, finalement, c'est un, une belle expérience de pensée, mais on est d'accord sur la finalité. Euh, Qu'est-ce que vous faites du problème de la polarisation, euh, du problème euh, de, du pluralisme On n'est pas d'accord sur la finalité, et c'est pas simplement qu'il y a de la défiance vis-à-vis -vis de l'État en général, euh, mais vis-à-vis -vis, euh, des autres positions politiques. Euh, et deuxièmement, euh, très rapidement, euh, vous n'avez pas parlé des médias et du rôle des grands médias. Euh, Est-ce que c'est pas euh, par les grands médias qu'on atteint euh, les masses euh, le plus euh, facilement Et je pense simplement à, aux, aux, aux problèmes sanitaires, ce, ce qui s'est produit en France pendant la crise sanitaire, c'est précisément que euh, il y a eu effectivement une défiance envers les autorités, qui était liée à ce que, euh, je, je pense une hypothèse, c'est que euh, la, la discussion euh, ne permettait pas à toutes les voix, même euh, folles, absurdes ou euh, euh, scandaleuses, euh, d'être euh, portées dans le débat public et réfutées publiquement par des raisons publiques. Voilà. Donc qu'est-ce que vous faites des grands médias it's all right, Jenny. Just like with the, the subtitles, we're able to uh, to catch the question in common. So I can I can uh, uh, 
give you back the floor for about 10 minutes. Sorry about the kind of undeliberative nature of this first session, but I, I think it will stimulate our reflections and discussion for the next three days. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry there wasn't more time for questions. Um, uh, so I'll, I'm try to try to answer. These are wonderful questions. Um, private corporations and uh, the, the role of capital. How do we handle that? in this world that we're coming to. I think I spoke of the role of social movements in changing norms. We don't have yet a norm that I just set out, namely that interdependence is going to create more regulation, more state coercion, and we need to legitimate it. That's not out there. I don't think you thought that before today. Now, if by some chance that idea became more accepted, if, if just the way gay liberation became accepted, if that idea that we are actually going to need more state coercion in order to handle our interdependence, that climate is not an outlier, climate is an example. If that idea became normatively accepted, yes, God damn it, we are going to have to have more state coercion. That then be can become a weapon against capital. In other words, if, if that were to be a norm, like gay liberation or even this, if people just thought, yes, that's, that's true, that's going to have to happen, We've got to have more state coercion and we've got to legitimate it. Then that becomes, well, all right, state, all right, corporations, you're part of the people who have to be regulated. Right now, corporations sort of get away with it in part because they ride on our desire for liberty. <laughs> you know, when, they, when corporations say, oh, we don't want regulation, they're appealing to all of us who don't want regulation. Um, and and they're managing to use that freedom impulse that all of us have manipulatively to be free, them, quote unquote, free themselves. Um, so that's a possibility. I'm not saying it's, it, but it's 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 a it's a direction. Um, the dark side of um, of of uh, of state, the unjustness. Yes. Uh, many years ago, I don't know how many years ago, 20 years ago, I wrote an article called Using Power, Fighting Power. And that was, it, in a way, the beginning of my own thinking on this. I was thinking, oh, it, and it's in the book. It's in the book. Um, what date was it, by the way? Um, and the idea there is that um, we have to both... And this is even in our psyches, although that particular, I wrote two articles. Um, we have to both use power to get the things we need through the state, and then at the same time, make sure that we're fostering areas of resistance that can resist that power. In other words, the more we have the state, I, I, I could only talk for 20 minutes, and, and it's true, I only made one side of the using power, fighting power argument. But because I thought that the rest of you knew the second sign, so to speak. But the more we need state coercion, the more we also have to facilitate pockets of resistance, uh, enclaves of resistance against that, because it has to be legitimate. And it's not always going to be legitimate. You know what happens when people get power. They do many, many things that, that are illegitimate. So who's going to hold them accountable? We need pockets of resistance. And that's not easy. It's not easy to use power and fight power at the same time. Even within our own heads, it's not easy to to um, accept the people who, you know, we're all products of power. We're all products. We're all products not of, 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 of political power. We're products of the power within our own family. And we, we have to use that in our worlds, but we also have to fight it. I'm speaking as a woman, you know, I don't know what these, my gestures, my, my very clothing, and the, I'm, I'm using my femaleness to some degree to 
you know my name, my nickname, Jenny. I said, call me Jenny. That was an attempt at making a connection. And that's a very female thing to do. I'm using that femaleness, and yet at the same time, I have to fight what femaleness means. And I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to use it and fight it at the same time, but I have to try. And it's the same way in the polity. We don't exactly know yet how to move forward with more state power and at the same time resist state power, but we have to learn. It's absolutely necessary that we learn. And we, the resistance can't overwhelm the state power. It can't be just resistance. It has to be. So we're stumbling forward. It's 1920, uh, 2022. Oh, that's a slip. 2022, we're stumbling forward here, but we are in a new world. We have to invent ways, not just, we not, not just invent new mechanisms like cities and assemblies. We have to invent new ways of thinking about this new world. And those new ways of thinking about this have to involve recognizing that we're going to have to have more state power. So, so how do we do that? We don't know yet. And, and we're going to have to experiment and struggle through. Um, and we have to recognize the dark side. We absolutely have to uh, in order to have the right kind of resistance. So that's the that's the task. I mean, I, I perhaps I should have should have framed the entire talk that way. Um, it was just that I, I wanted to try to explain the, the other side because I didn't think that would be something that you would have thought of. Um, from the you know from the masses to the masses. I, I used to love Mao, and I still love Mao. <laughs> Damn it, he was very smart. Um, you know that. I mean, he invented, I hadn't realized he invented recursive representation. Except masses? Come on. We move past masses, I think. I hope. Um, if the state is going to think of everybody here as masses, they're thinking wrong. When I talked about rec recognizing the autonomy of each citizen, designing the state so it respected each citizen, that means respecting the difference in each citizen. Not, and the word masses erases that difference. So the recursive part is terrific. The masses part, I reject. Um, so ex ex we need to experiment. Um, and same with the control of pro private property. I don't think it necessarily requires huge power. Um, again, we talked last night about taming capitalism rather than necessarily getting rid of capitalism. And I think, you know, I think of the Nordic countries, I think of Denmark, et cetera, et cetera. How did capitalism get tamed there? Partly through the great power of unions, which we no longer have, and partly through the role of norms. There was strong norms that capital shouldn't do X and shouldn't do Y and shouldn't do Z. Now, we may not have the unions, but we have us. We have social movements. Um, it, it, they, if if the social movements are respecting workers and finding ways of bringing wor workers into the movement, it doesn't have to be only a workers' movement. It can be a social movement that makes a genuine effort to understand that there are different kinds of incentives to bring working people with working class backgrounds into the movement, and you have to think about that consciously and provide those incentives and provide and make sure that there's. That there's power that working class people have power there, not the people in the audience who don't speak. Um, so, so if we bring some social movements together, we may be able uh, to to get. Particularly since the world, you know, let's think about ecology. Uh, the world is getting more and more conscious of the fact that we're destroying ourselves. I think many many people who didn't think that ten years ago are now are now completely convinced. You know, they look at the glaciers, they look at this, they look at that. The world has changed in 10 years. So so we've got something on our side in uh, against the power of corporations. It needs to be organized. I'm not saying we'll win, <laughs> but but uh, changing norms if as and putting those norms in uh, that we need more, that we need more legitimate state power. Um, yeah, okay, then I'll stop. Uh, then I'll stop. The NGOs you write and Schmitter and Oh, the common good. No, I don't think the common good is just immediately quite to the contrary. I don't think the common good is just, as Musa said, uh, you know, all you have to do is look at it and, whoo, 
then you just follow it. No, I think the common good has to be constructed, it has to be discussed, it has to be deliberated, and often what you find when you deliberate is conflict, not the common good. Um, but And when you find common conflict, negotiate that conflict. Alors on en reste là, malheureusement il y a une dimension un peu frustrante à tout ça, mais euh, comme, comme je le disais, en fait, il y a quand même euh, plein de questions qui vont être débattues pendant ces, euh, ces trois jours. Un, un très grand merci à tous les trois, euh, Jane, Samuel et, 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 et Yves. Alors du coup, vu qu'on avait commencé un petit peu en retard, du coup la, la, la pause qui était prévue entre ces deux moments est un peu raccourcie. Je vais donc vous inviter à, à, à vous diriger vers les, les différents panels qui sont, euh, qui sont prévus. Il y en a un, je crois, dans la salle juste à côté, l'amphithéâtre, et les deux autres sont au quatrième étage. Il y a des ascenseurs, euh, si vous le souhaitez, vous pouvez prendre un petit café au passage, mais n'hésitez pas à commencer euh, relativement vite, euh, néanmoins, pour qu'on ne prenne pas trop de retard pour le déjeuner ce midi à partir de 13h, où tous les intervenants, discutants, euh, euh, sont euh, évidemment euh, invités euh, à, à manger euh, sur place. Ce sera au quatrième étage, en salle euh, panoramique. Voilà, je crois qu'on peut de nouveau applaudir nos intervenants pour cette session passionnante.